and uh, he works at what? Casey Wellman. Oh, Casey sorry Wellman about already did that I wrong. Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Time for the weekend. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so Casey's working at the brewery De Ranken in Belgium. And I met him um, last summer when uh, Powell, uh, I also interviewed him here, um, visited a brewery. And uh, you and Powell, you guys know each other um, quite well, I think. And yep, I've known Powell through the beer judging scene. Uh, he was yeah. up in Poland, I was over in Prague. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you told me your story and I was like, yeah, I must have you on my uh, podcast. So Casey, please, um, how did you, what do you do, first of all, in the brewery? <laughs> well, I'm technically independent, though anyone who talks to me about it uh, would say <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> um, I was initially hired a, yeah, just about a year ago, a little bit more. Um, to take over for the brewery tours, uh, work in the tap room or tasting room, mm -hmm. and then help in production in addition to that. So in theory, my work is split between production and the tours or tap rooms or the tap room. But as of what I'm doing right now, we don't have the tap room running. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The confinement to home. Um, so my new project may be starting tomorrow already. Uh, I'm doing home delivery in Dotini. <laughs> oh, cool. yeah, all the brewers starting to do that now. Eh? Brewers and bars. Uh... Yeah. yeah, I just picked up my uh, cargo trailer for my bicycle today. Yeah. <laughs> so we were right. uh, fueled by uh, beer, delivering beer. <laughs> uh, tell a little bit in the beginning. So you're uh, you're an American yeah. um, natively. Yeah. Where where in America you're from? Uh, I'm from Minnesota, so that's, for those who don't know, that's in the center and north of the United, continental United States. Um, I come from the countryside there, uh, never really thought of living anywhere else um, uh -uh. until I was maybe 18 or 19. Because um, yeah, it was a nice life out in the countryside. But uh, as it happens, uh, beer catches the curiosity of people. I wanted to work in the beer industry, and I didn't want to work in the American beer industry, surprisingly oh, okay. enough. Why is that? Because um, the market's crazy, in my opinion. Uh, it's chaotic. It's, there's, a lot of, there's so many trends there. Um, the businesses grow quite fast. Um, yeah. And for me, that uh, it was a sense of instability, like not that beer craft beer will not influence beer in general over time but uh the instantly week to week day to day what as a brewer you're going to make so i was okay. seeking to work in a more relaxed and stable market actually yeah uh, so the you, you feel there was a quite a rush on product and work and labor is it work labor i think or yeah, is it product wise that you don't like the american the environment of the industry um i i love um, so many american brewers and their beers there's such great products and people mm -hmm. over there um but i don't know it's like uh this was long before even the hazy ipas and the hard yeah, yeah. seltzers you name it but uh it's just with that suddenly every customer 40 or 50 percent of your customers want the thing that all the others are making uh, yes and that takes away yeah. a sense of um what you're trying to offer to people um you are you give people what they ask for exactly what they ask for and mm -hmm. then you're not making what you want to make you're not making an expression of uh your values yeah yeah okay um not so you don't want to do the, the typical that. commercial um new trends it's like you want something stable and oh, the, i find the trends exhausting yeah oh, okay okay, okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather work with beers that'll be there next week next month next year next oh, decade yeah, yeah. Uh, okay cool because uh, for me then i'm even though you're making the thing over and over just like from a kitchen if you have the item on the menu it's not the same plate going out to every person uh, over the years oh. uh but I, I like the sense of beer actually i like the sense that you're kind of having the same thing as somebody else in another place um and it's made in a specific place uh, there's a nice sense of place to that um and i i think if the product comes and goes and changes and 
which it'll always change, but if yeah. it's chaotic like that, you're, you're not losing as fast that as the market changed. Aspect. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so how did you get the, the I don't want to work in the American beer industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but sorry, your the, question. The, 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 so you got a beer passion already in the States. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was, I was home brewing at university or college as we called okay. it. Uh, because I was under 21, which is the legal age for consuming alcohol, but I was interested in beer. Mm -hmm. And the most, the easiest way to get an idea of different beer or flavors, because it was interesting to me, was just to make it myself. So it's I started to brew your brewing. own stash, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I would ask my friends to buy some for me, and they would mess up my orders, they would get me the wrong beer. <laughs> <laughs> is it also like Which, in the movies with the fake driver license is. ID that you do it? Or no, 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 I, di I didn't want to do that. That's like, I find identity, like fake identity and all that way too serious just to uh, get a beer. Okay. <laughs> like I didn't, I would never want to go that far. Uh, uh, okay. But I still wanted to taste and consume this thing. Um, so yeah, I would ask friends to go pick some things up for me. I would call the store in advance to make sure they had it. Then I would make a list and send them just to taste it, because the flavors of beer, I find them really interesting. Uh, and yeah, eventually I started home brewing. Um, and when it came time where I wanted to study in another country for a semester or a year, uh, Belgium was high on the list, just because I tasted so many interesting flavors from Belgian beers, and it seemed like a complicated yet very interesting place. Okay. What did you study? Communications. All right, um, all right, cool. And linguistics, and, then, and anthropology, and French, and Italian, but the paper says communications. Ah, okay, cool. And then you you went a year abroad in Belgium, I assume. Yep, I went a semester abroad. Uh, in doing that, I got a residence card for one year. I decided to not let that go to waste, so I stayed the whole year. Uh, <laughs> That's a great compliment. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, when I saw the card, I'm like, oh, I can stay a year. Oh, fine, uh, that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so most of that time wasn't necessarily studying, but it was more visiting breweries uh, on my bicycle. Uh, yeah. I, it was quite a nice, lazy year. I really, really enjoyed it. And, and then you really went to the to the Belgium uh, quality beers already, of course. Or you were oh, yeah, you were yeah. not a typical student to drink or who drinks his Schuppler and his uh, Duvel, but you went the. No, no. It was Monday. I didn't have class, so I would hop on the train with my folding bicycle. Uh, I still have it. Actually, I was riding it today. Uh, and then you could get. Uh, with the Go Pass, it's a 10 ride yeah. train pass over here in Belgium. You could buy it for 50 euros, and that meant you would get 10 one way trips for 5 euros each on train anywhere in the country. Yeah. And you could take the pool and bike for free. So I could go anywhere in Belgium for 5 euros, visit breweries, uh, yeah, you name it. Uh, so it was really great. I made so many friends doing that, uh, people who I'm still in really close contact with. Um, it was just a nice way to visit places. You take the train, you make the extra 5, 10, 15 kilometers by bicycle, and you get to know places, you get to know people. Uh, uh, you're very much exposed to what's going on. Uh, and yeah, that's how it, I guess it all started. All right, and, <laughs> and then after a year, you, <laughs> you, you went back to the States then to finish yeah, your school. Uh... Yeah, I was, well, I was already invested in... Uh, University, it's expensive in the U.S., so I figured I would go back home and finish that. Wasting. Uh, um, yeah, rather than waste all that uh, energy, <laughs> it goes into not get a paper. I, I learned things. Yeah, the paper. <laughs> it, uh, the it's important. Paper. It also helps me have my business license here. It's a yeah, yeah. Of course, you need to have a bachelor at least uh, in Belgium, otherwise you yeah. need to do an extra exam for a tax number. Yeah, so yeah, so I I don't. Um, I don't hold any bitterness, but I was sad to leave Belgium. Um, so I went back to the U.S. for a year and plotted my return, uh, basically, <laughs> for later on. Um, then, well, if it's interesting, I was working at a homebrew supplier there. Um, started talking with some friends that I had from the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, about coming back to Europe. Um, Prague seemed a bit easier. Prague and the Czech Republic seemed a bit easier than Belgium uh, for the paperwork. Uh, 
also okay. it was interesting to learn new things. So I ended up uh, after 13 months in the States moving to Prague uh, with a vague okay. notion of uh, learning about Czech beer, uh, knowing I had a small network there and yeah. not much else. So it was pure <laughs> paper-wise that you landed up in the Czech Republic and not in Belgium not, after that? Not purely. Not purely. Um, I, I like languages. I'm interested in them. Czech okay. is a frustrating language, I will say. Um, <laughs> Czech paperwork is also very frustrating. <laughs> I did after living there five years. Um, so you stayed five years at the, at the Czech Republic, Republic then? It was interesting and practical. And I thought maybe six months, two years, somewhere in that range is how long I would stay. But I stayed five in the end. Yeah. And uh, uh, tell me a bit about the bureaucracy in Czechia. I know there is a little story in that also. <laughs> oh, about the bureaucracy. Um, well, I don't even know where to start. It was my life <laughs> for five years. Um, Czechs are famous at uh, having very organized system. Oh, really? Um, but yeah, but, but there's a lo there are a lot of papers to get stamped, to get stamped at another desk, to okay. get paid. Uh, there's an order of events that's, uh, if you don't know the structure, you're not familiar with it, it's very confusing. Uh, okay. And language skills are very important there. Um, but yeah, if you're an immigrant there and you don't have, if you're trying to do things on your own, if you're not asking for help, or if you um, are getting help for whatever reason, you just end up getting lost in paperwork. Um, I think I spent more time in the five years on waiting visas, waiting a decision from the Ministry of Interior than I did actually with real permission that I could stay. Uh, just because okay. they make decisions, they reject things uh, in an but untrue way. But how did you, how did you way, land you in the Czech Republic then? Wait. Like, Sorry? When you came there, what was your, your first uh, job or your... You came uh, as a student? No. Um... No, no, no. Uh, wasn't studying. I, wanted to spend some time outside of universities for a while. Um, mm -hmm. No, I was just searching for work and the easiest work to find was uh, English as a second language there. Um, there are lots of language schools. Um, anyone raised or educated before the 1990s was yeah. maybe learning Russian or German as a second language. And now uh, that English yeah. might be interesting for work. There, there are a lot of clients for that. And it's relatively easy to organize. So I did okay. that for about two years. I taught English. Okay. Uh, and and beer wise, the, uh, you beer went into the Czech beer? Bit. Yep. Um, basically, as a way of trying to make friends uh, or to try to network <laughs> with some brewers, I, yeah. I was a member of the Beer Judge Certification Program in that short time in the US. And I had that membership, and I thought, oh, maybe there are some people from this community I can meet, talk with. And uh, it turns out there weren't very many from the Beer Judge Certification Program already there. Um, so I started building up the membership a little bit. I was running some training courses. Uh, that's how I know Pavel. <laughs> sort of evangelized some people, which... Later, I look back and I'm like, oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we were doing some training courses, uh, getting, trying to get some feedback to home brewers, trying to bring home brewers together a little bit. Um, and I was involved in that quite heavily for a few years. I passed all of that on to other people now. Um, so you so... organized courses there or it was more, it was like a hobby thing or it was a semi professional yeah, a thing, thing, business that you were running at, at site? Yeah, I guess on paper, some aspects of it were semi professional or business. Oh, but, okay. uh, it wasn't to make money or it yeah, wasn't no. really making money doing it. Yeah. Um, to get your social life on track. So, yeah. Yeah. It was just more or less to meet people and I've met, met a lot of interesting friends that way. Um, so I was involved in that for a few years, and it's great. And now the people who were involved in it then, they're running the Prague Home Brewing Competition every year. Oh, cool. They do monthly, not right now, but they do monthly um, sort of beer tastings where if you submit a beer, you get feedback. The judges get practice. Um, so that's nice. They're running all sorts of great things there. Uh, so now and the I guess is really more mature there in the uh, style of uh, contest and judging. 
It's more, I would say, in the style of modern craft beer. Okay. Whether it's mature or not, I wouldn't know to say. But um, you see more styles and more people experience the tasting, giving feedback on uh, things that aren't Czech lager, basically. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. went to the country of the Eurozone with <laughs> lager, with Pils beer, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, lagers, whether they're light lagers, kind of standard strength lagers, dark lagers, which could be lighter or stronger. Uh, that's most of the beer there by volume for sure. But yeah. also, I don't know the stats, but probably most of the beers on the market are that. Of course. Um, They invented it. <laughs> in some ways, contributed to the inventing of it for sure. Um, But yeah, and eventually I became, I started doing beer tours as well because some of my friends from the beer community were doing beer tours and that was fun. Tourism is a big industry in Prague, so it's another oh, aspect Prague, of yeah, it okay, I can cool. do. Um, and yeah, that, that was sort of what my life became in the Czech Republic. Uh, I was a beer guide uh, the last couple of years, <laughs> spending a lot of time in pubs, which, which I loved. Uh, Sounds like heaven to me. Like you, uh, yeah, it was great. your day job. You're in the scene. You're you're sitting there, and Prague is one of the most yeah. uh, best cities to live in, in court, according to a lot of uh, rankings. Ah, uh, yeah. My my favorite part about it was the parks, actually. Um, yeah. And the public transport is excellent there as well. Oh. Um, like it's a very pleasant city to live in. Most people avoid Old Town and the city center, maybe not right now, uh, but uh, because of the tourism is very highly concentrated in the city. Uh -huh. uh, you have a very small zone of the city where you have all of these people, all going between the same big monuments and things, which is really wonderful for them. Great experience, great for the city's economy, I guess, as well. Uh, but most people just avoid it because uh, it's uh -huh. so heavily concentrated. But A kilometer from that, or even a couple streets from that, you don't even feel it. Um, so I love the parks. Most of them have a great view. The nature in the city is great. Um, I see why people like Prague. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, eventually I moved on. I was already working uh, seasonally for uh, a Lambic producer, Aud Bersel. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Our friends of Aud Bersel. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I knew them from when I was studying uh, in Brussels. They're, they were a short bike ride from Brussels, They're 11 kilometers from... Yeah, so you studied in Brussels, Brussels. you're year yep. abroad. Uh, yep, and then so I, was still, city, yeah. I was visiting Belgium again uh, <laughs> when I was living in the Czech Republic. Uh, you don't have Lambic over there. Oh, now uh, you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's changed. Uh, but yeah, and so I was doing trips to Belgium quite regularly um, at that okay. point. And then I got the idea of moving over to Belgium um, in these last years. I started thinking about that again because I, I really like this country. But uh, uh, And then after, um, it's in Czech, uh, Czech Republic, I assume that you met Powell also because he speaks quite good yeah. uh, Czech, for, uh, his Polish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was always trying to speak Czech to me in the beginning when we first met. And I, uh, my Czech is, it's slightly functional, but it's, <laughs> it's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, it's a limited, like, we'll say a young child's uh, grasp on the language, uh, yeah. except I can only talk about beer uh, and, and legal problems. <laughs> Those are the only things I can talk about. <laughs> Um, immigration and beer. Um, so it's not that functional, actually. Uh, but yeah, uh, Pavel's a big enthusiast, uh, enthusiast of Czech beer, Czech culture. Uh, his Czech language skills are great, too. Uh, for those who don't get the reference, Pavel Wyszynski is... Uh, yeah, we will, uh, know, we will look him up a little bit. A, I already interviewed he's him. Mega, uh, he's a sort of mega beer geek of Pavel Wyszynski. <laughs> Voila, and here you go. Oh, I'm an idiot. Of course, I'm an Are idiot. You I, need to, on the I need to screen show here? it. So, oh, Ugly Dieter is gonna go out. Oh, yes, there he is. Oh. Excuse me while I grab a beer here.
Ah, yeah, there's the man. Yeah, so he's running a lot of beer tasting things. He has been for quite a long time. Uh, Pavel also is quite involved in uh, the beer judging scene. I believe he's been doing off-flavor testing distribution at one point. He's worked for a well-known malt house as well uh, as a sales rep. He's just overall also quite involved in the beer industry. There. And uh, Dieter, I actually can't hear you now, so I don't know if I'm talking over you or if you can hear me. Uh... Hello? I know what I did wrong. <laughs> Something with the settings. Yeah, yeah uh, here I am. Um... Yeah. Could you hear yeah. me at all? I didn't what? know if you were talking or not. I was just started talking again because I... Yeah, I need, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know I was uh, saying that Paul was also the organizer of the Warsaw Beer Festival. Yes. Um, that's in this year, uh, 2020, with the pandemic, uh, was cancelled in the um, in this version of the year, the beginning of the year. But the, the cool oh, yeah. thing is they do it twice a year. How cool is that? Yeah, the beer festival that's twice a year. <laughs> it's like yeah, <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I, I like actually, that. I actually promised like, all right, uh, yeah, like, to to my friends like, all right, I'm gonna go in the spring, and I already went there last time, but I'm not gonna yeah. go two times a year to wash out because that's mm -hmm. a little bit too much. But now yeah, now it's cancelled, so now I have to go again at yep. the end of the year for the festival <laughs> and to support uh, Paul and the Polish scene, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's what a great festival. I, I love the organization of it. The quality of beers is great. Uh, the yeah, energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just love the enthusiasm of the Warsaw Beer Festival. Well, when was your for, first time that you went to the Warsaw Beer Festival? I've only been one time, actually. Uh, huh. 2018, perhaps? I want to say the spring edition of, spring of 2018. I'm not quite sure on that. I have a glass somewhere in my apartment, but it's not in this room. Um, but it, it's fantastic. Yeah. They make a custom glass for every edition, a handmade yeah, glass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's your tasting glass. So it's, it's such a cool memory and souvenir uh, kind of thing there. Uh, yeah. But I've you also know um, the, the new project that Paul is doing now, the, the Walney Craft thing. Uh, is that the off flavors or no 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 uh, wait we will see it now normally you still Perhaps. should be able to hear me now no I I haven't talked with him about that yet ah, that's, uh, well, that's quite this... new a yeah. months old maybe <laughs> so I, I haven't talked to him, him uh, last a week months, ago so. like this is his yeah. new um, organization and it's like yeah. to unite more the craft brewers in order mm -hmm. to get some changes in uh, Polish law and uh, bureaucratic ah, system through. Okay. Um, and also yeah. to be like a, a, more like a trademark for what is craft, what is quality, not like judging, but more like knowing what's inside of it and mm -hmm. to have more openness in towards the, the sector. So that's, that's fantastic. Only craft, uh, you're, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an organization based in Poland. So mm -hmm. for us um, in Belgium, it's less, uh, less active in that, but it's cool. He's uh, now getting also more into the the front end of the crisis. Is going to hit very hard in Poland for the brewers mm -hmm. and for the uh, for the for the bars that are need to be closed. So he now tries to like in Poland they cannot ship uh, finished beer towards an end consumer. You really have to oh. go to the brewery or so to get it. So okay. all the things we have of web shop or anything, a lot of there because of Polish um, legislation is not allowed. And he tries mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to bring that under the nose of people. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That's another thing about the U.S. that was always complicated to uh, logistics. But in Belgium, it's not actually that difficult. A lot of beer distributors in Belgium, you can go right to their shop. Yeah, man. Yeah, in Belgium, beer. we also have when you have a brewery, it's kind of a tradition almost to have a tasting room also yeah. i think that in poland uh, to come back to paul is not allowed because if you are a brewer you're a brewing company yeah. and 
that's that company. If you want to serve alcohol and people consume it there, then mm -hmm. you need to have a pub license. Yeah, okay, yeah. you think you, okay, that's a different company. And then you need to have one person only for that company at least. Oh. So in uh -huh. Belgium, in Belgium is totally not true. In Belgium, so you have a brewer, you want to drink your beer, you have a tasting room, uh, which mm -hmm. is quite good. Yeah, you might need some permissions for it, but that can be the same person. Yeah, yeah, but you don't need to hire legally extra staff to run a separate company in order to open it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's fascinating the way alcohol can be regulated in different places. Uh, uh, tell yeah, me a bit, like, then. so from um, Czech Republic, you're um, back to Belgium then. <laughs> yes. And uh, finding your, your current job at the brewery, the, the rank, uh, how did that went? Yeah. Oh, I, uh, huh. Yeah. So when I was working, uh, when I was working seasonally in Belgium, uh, okay, that was a funny moment actually. Um, so it's a combination of all of these things. So I was training beer judges, and uh, in the Czech Republic, things have changed a lot in the last years. But if you look at like 2016, perhaps. Um, you just had a few people on the front edge of different beer styles, uh, new wave brewing, we'll say all of that. And we were talking about beer styles and tasting beer styles. And I was like, okay, it's our Lambic session, guys, get excited. And like, mm -hmm. we've never tasted any of this before, all, <laughs> all these wild fermented mixed fermentation beers. We don't know how to describe them. And I'm like, oh no, that's, I, I feel so bad for you. We, we have to go to Belgium. Um, and I was just starting my seasonal work at Outbersel, I don't know, some months later. And I said, okay, guys, I will organize, I'll take a week off and I'll add, I'll stay an extra week in Belgium. And you'll all come and we'll visit breweries together and we'll do tastings and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a tour. Uh, Duranka wasn't one of those stops that time, I believe. Um, but I ended up repeating this with other people because more, more people wanted to come to Belgium from the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, um, from Poland, actually, too. Pavel was on one of the trips. Um, <laughs> from these kind of beer geek circles, brewers, bartenders, uh -huh. bar owners, uh, just amateur, like beer lovers. Uh, and I guess I kept going back to Duranka and Nino, one of the two owners of Duranka and the boss, uh, mm -hmm. He, uh, he always remembered me from these beer trips because he thought it was a funny group. Uh, it's <laughs> a group of Central Europeans with an American guide. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a strange group, I guess. Uh, but he always loved us. Um, and some years later, when I was looking for an opportunity in Belgium, XX Bitters always, ever since I met it or got to know it, it's been one of my favorite beers. Um, it's probably my, my absolute favorite beer. Um, and that's what I'm drinking now. Uh, that's what's on my t-shirt as well. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> but, uh, and that's just a coincidence. Um, but when an opportunity popped up to work at Duranka, I think I wrote Nino a few hours later and he's like, really? You'd move here for that? And I said, yeah. And so we set up a time for me to come to Dotini, check out the region. Um, check out apartments, places I could rent while I'm getting settled in, all of that. He's incredibly helpful in all of it. And uh, it's a year later, I think it's a really good fit. Um, and I'm independent, so I still have capacity to do other tourism projects, which I yeah. like to do from time to time. You have your freedom in that. Uh, yeah, it's nice. Um, I'm mostly busy there, but I can do other things. Um, I have some academic projects I do as well. Um, writing about the economics of beer with a few colleagues who actually know economics. Um, like like uh, volunteerly work or like an extra study thing? Well, um, I'm co-teaching a summer course on the economics mm -hmm. of Belgian beer. Um, we do that every year. Um, that's at the VUB. Or oh, the okay. College okay, cool, under cool, the cool. VUB now or under that umbrella. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah, we keep talking about writing books, so it's nice to be able to do that. We'll be in a book on, i got to think of what it's called. Uh, it's going to be out, Oxford's publishing it next month. It's from the Beeronomics Society. 
which is a, a group of beer-loving economists. Um, it'll be called New Developments in the Brewing Industry. Um, Oxford's publishing it next month. We wrote a couple chapters in that as well um, about contract brewing and uh, the global hop supply as well uh, and how that's changed in the last years. Because beer is fascinating from an economics perspective too. Um, you have a lot of data from taxes mostly historically, but there's a lot of data you don't have as well. Um, company sales per year. It's pretty difficult to get some stats or all of the closed breweries in Belgium, the ones that disappeared in the 80s and before that, uh, or at the World Wars, the ones that disappeared. Um, so it's, it's a really fun aspect of the brewing industry to study. I'm particularly fascinated about Belgium, but... In how, did, how do you study it? You're like a data researcher in it, or you, you process a lot of material, uh, peer-reviewed material, and then you do it on, on an for, academical level, the processing, or is it like data processing? Uh, that we're you do? kind of, we're a mixed team, the, the three of us that have been working together. We're also the three who have been working on this uh, summer beer course. Um, Sven van Kerkhoven, he is the, what is he now? I guess he's a vice dean at the VUB um, in the economics faculty. He's, uh, he's an economist and a professor. Um, and he's really great at research, um, getting a lot of economic figures, formulas together. Um, he's really our, definitely our data guy, I would say. And then my other partner on that, Michelangelo van Merten, um, he, he was actually my, uh, the director of my study program when I studied in Brussels a long time ago. Uh, he introduced me to Belgian beer a bit. I introduced him further into Belgian beer. <laughs> um, but he's an economic historian uh, who, who loves beer. So he's our history guy. He goes really in-depth research, um, putting stories together as well. And I'm the guy in the beer industry, so I help get our contacts together if we need uh, some data from a brewery uh, that hopefully I get along with. Um, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> it's cool. Belgium, you know. <laughs> yeah, because the um, course is also online, eh? if, I don't, if I'm not wrong. It might be online this summer. Yeah, because I met the other <laughs> beer idiot told me, like, yeah, there is the ULB, the... Uh, that might Universe be a different one. Libre Belgique, who does a beer course this summer, and okay, so yeah. you're in that. That group might be a different the... one. I oh, you could be my teacher. <laughs> nice, nice. No, I, I think that's a different group. Yeah. Actually, I don't think that's us. Um, oh, but actually, in these last years, it's uh, it's been a great time to organize beer-related projects in Belgium mm -hmm. since they got the UNESCO um, cultural. Uh, oh, Cultural yeah. heritage. Uh, yeah, culture, yeah. Because Belgium um, beer is beer called... culture in Belgium. Yeah, Wereld uh, Erfgoed in Dutch. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forget how to translate that exactly. Yeah. Uh, world, uh, yeah, something you get from, yeah, whatever. I think cultural heritage. Uh, yeah, cultural. More... Yeah, world cultural heritage. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, and yeah, actually, ever since that's been recognized, it's much easier to put proposals forward. Um, I don't know about funding for projects, but at least getting projects approved. For example, a summer course about Belgian beer at a small college university. It's not that hard to get someone to agree to that in the management. They're like, oh, you want yeah. to do beer thing. Uh, that sounds a little <laughs> silly. But when we're like, no, actually, it's a special thing in Belgium. It's this, and we can back that up a lot more now um, without being seen as a joke, uh, which I really yeah, appreciate. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a fascinating industry. There are aspects of agriculture, logistics. Uh, taxes are complicated quite often in beer. Um, the legal restrictions, there are so many facets of it. and It's, it's a fascinating product, I think. Um, it's complicated to move around. Uh, so I just got my, I'm gonna start doing, I'm doing a test run tomorrow. I'm be, partially because of the crisis mm -hmm. uh, and people having to stay at home, the confinement, uh, but also partially because it's fun. Uh, and I think it's an interesting service. I'm going to start delivering beer by bicycle from our brewery in Dottigny, maybe a bit outside, we will see. Um, 
and beer's heavy. I will say that it's in glass bottles. Heavy quite beer often. is good. <laughs> it's heavy. It's difficult to move around. You used to have horse carriages pulling it uh, around. Uh, now trucks make it a lot easier. Um, you could have ship freight or air freight. It's a little more expensive for beer, but it's possible. Uh, but it's a heavy thing, and it's actually complicated mm -hmm. to move as well. And so you're you're really thinking about these different things, um, including that as you get around to it. Yeah, yeah indeed. It's, it's, it's a very difficult product yeah. to, uh, it is. to move on a bit scale. Yeah. But I, I think it's worth it because it... Okay, so it has a limited... We'll say a limited shelf life for a best before time. But it's a food product that you can make in batches, that you can ship around. And so someone in Limbourg, all the way on the other side of Belgium, or all the way in Brussels, <laughs> uh, an hour away. <laughs> uh, or over here, we can technically have the same batch of beer in similar quality. And I, think, I think that's a marvel. Because uh, it's a food product, or it's considered a food product. But you, we can experience the same thing uh, at a distance. Uh, more, more I want to touch on the academical yes. point then. Um, okay. This crisis, what do you think, uh, the, for the people listening, the pandemic in Europe, uh, the, mm -hmm. a lot of bars need to be closed uh, for one, two months. Um, what do you think in Belgium or maybe Europe that will do towards, um, yeah, there will be less brewers, less bars, of course, but mm -hmm towards product and towards the industry, what do you think that this will kickstart? Um, I think, and I'm very interested and curious to see that when pubs and restaurants reopen, mm -hmm. how that impacts which products they have available and their agreements. Um, some people may know that a majority of pubs have either a contract with or are owned by a brewery, which is often one of just a few breweries. Uh, AB and Bev, the world's yeah. biggest beer producer. In Belgium, uh, we're talking about Belgium. Elk and now, Mas, yeah. yeah, we'll talk about Belgium. Elk and yeah. Mas, uh, which is, I believe, under Heineken. Um, or Duvel now. Duvel's already quite big. Uh, or Hacht, uh, that's another big one. Um, and Often the bar owners or managers, they're paying rent to the breweries if the brewery owns it. Yeah. Or they have an agreement for yes. volumes for certain prices or things. Yeah. And I've heard stories, or, or Palm is another one. Uh, I've heard stories or references to the fact that the breweries are just saying, don't pay rent right now. Uh, we want your pub to be there afterwards. Yeah. So I'm curious yeah, to see if those if pubs they have cannot an sell their product. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, so for Belgium, that's that's a general bar, and for the listeners, yeah. a normal in Belgium, it's quite normal that let's say um, eighty percent of the bars or the property yeah. of the bar is owned by the brewery, mm -hmm. and they rent it out in a contract towards. Yeah, you can have your bar here, you can run it, but you buy ninety percent of our beers and you pay yeah. rent to us. Yeah, so, they are uh, often. Sorry if my camera is doing a strange thing. I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> Very strange. Uh, yes, it looks... Uh, never seen that before. Um, oh, I saw my eye. Okay, I'm still here. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's quite often that the only beers on tap are... Yep. Oh. In bottles. Mm -hmm. Um... I'll try turning my camera off uh, and on. No problem, I will. Yep, and then now I still have you. Yes, all right. I'm back? Yes, uh, yeah, okay. your visual's not, <laughs> but I put you in okay. a little square down, down yeah, here. Yeah, it's less distracting. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but your um, sound is so perfect, so. Okay, that's great. And so it's quite often if they sell enough volume or if they're meeting a minimum of that contract, they can sell other beers too. Uh, that's a lot of, for example, Duranka's clients as well. We're in the fridge. Um, but we're seeing maybe more tap space and all of that. And my sympathy really goes out actually to all the bartenders and bar owners. I have a lot of friends who are doing their owning or operating a bar. And depending on the situation you had before the crisis, it may be more difficult or less difficult actually to, uh, to function right now or to maintain yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I, I think businesses, whether it's bars, restaurants, or if breweries are a bit further up the chain. Um, so maybe the consequences are a bit delayed for us. Um, yeah, they can still now produce maybe, less, yeah. but yeah, the shock yeah. will come it, if you don't sell enough. Yeah. Then... I mean, we can make beer now if we want, but if we have stock of it and that's not selling right now, what's the point of making that beer that people might drink in September? Uh, <laughs> We don't know either. Uh, so we also feel some uncertainty, but it's it depends on the brewery, I think, quite a lot and what the financial and sales situations were before the the crisis. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, and for, let's say, your average uh, craft bar around the corner in, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, in Europe, in Belgium, mm -hmm. yeah, they don't have the luxury that like, they're not owned, the property is not owned by... Uh, by a big brewer, so yeah, they have to pay the rent. Yeah. That job yeah. is going to be harder. Yeah, I really hope uh, those guys are hanging in there. Because uh, <laughs> I, I want to see these places again when, when they're reopened. Uh, yeah, it, that might be really hard. Uh, if they've, they're they owning all of their equipment, they, they're paying the rent uh, to somebody that's not in on a contract with them uh, for their business. Uh, their staff, I don't know what they have to do for them. That could all be different. Uh, that could be quite hard. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, in these times, what can we do? We, we, we're we taking care of our health, our health infrastructure as well right now, uh, seeing what happens. Um, and a lot of these other projects might suffer from that, uh, being mm -hmm. deprioritized, but... I, we just have to get through this first. Yeah. What do you think of the idea that um, so a lot of brewers in Belgium then are now starting to like, hey, you can buy a package and uh, I will deliver mm -hmm. it only in my commune or in my province or whatever, yep. uh, very mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, well, I think at some point it, it's great because, well, first of all, people can stay in confinement without having to go to the shop mm -hmm. or they're not buying from the supermarket, which supermarkets are great for a number of things, but um, yeah, but not to support your local craft. With, uh... Yeah, you lose contact with who's making what you're having. Um, it's a very efficient but distant sort of um, experience. And honestly, I don't like going to supermarkets. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that picture. Uh, it's yeah. from somewhere in Prague, a bike shop. Uh, cool. And I think it's a newfound chance for people to realize there's a brewery in their area. When I came to Dotigny, mm -hmm. actually, it's changed quite a lot in the last year that I've been here. But uh, when I came to Dotigny, or I live in Muscron, which is seven kilometers from the brewery. Um, when I came here, most people I would run into in the streets had no idea there was a brewery in Dotini. Like, yeah, 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 if we drive the like, car it's there. Duranka. <laughs> Do you not know beer? It's Duranka. It's an important Duranka. place. Uh, it's an institution in Belgian beer. Uh, but yeah, people don't have necessarily have contact with their local products, knowing what others are doing uh, nearby. Yeah. Um, and so also. Maybe a chance to do that, even if it's driven by pressure of not selling what's in stock because nobody's placing yeah. orders. Yeah. And you have your local mm -hmm. product, of course, but also um, in the case in more bigger cities in Belgium, you have mm -hmm. your local craft bar, which is also mm -hmm. struggling. But then you have, yeah. uh, like today I had a decision to make, do I order a package from my brewer? Or do I go to my craft bar and oh, order yeah. a package there? And yeah, then, that's also um, an important thing to do. Yeah, and you have to support the two of them because you want your brewer to be there after the pandemic, but you also mm -hmm. want to have um, your craft bar to be there so that you can get the beer. So the, the yeah. thing that I got in my head was like, okay, if it's in the same province or commune where I live, mm -hmm. I support my bar because I want my yeah. bar to be there. And if it's outside my little commune, I support the brewers directly because then everybody in the little commune can support their bar. The bar hopefully survives 
And then when uh, enough people from different provinces where, where the amount is huger can support mm -hmm. the, the brewers. So mm -hmm. yeah, I locally think support your bar. And mm -hmm. I, I think it shows level. people that their customers are still there for them and that uh, they want it to exist after all of this. Because I'm sure in any number of industries, we can even go outside beer for that. Yeah. Uh, the doubt flashes through people's mind. Will I continue with this after this? Will it be possible? Will it be possible to continue in the same way? And everybody at some point would have considered maybe discontinuing at least certain aspects of what they do to carry on. That's, that's life. And when you're supporting these projects in these hard times, you're indicating to them that it's, it's worth that, them being there. Um, that uh, you're encouraging them to go on. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, um, it gives some, not just some support, but some, some hope uh, also. Yeah, indeed. Um, final question that I want to ask to you, uh, Casey. Mm -hmm. If there is a definition of craft beer, uh, does it exist? And so, yes, what is it for you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. honestly, uh, craft beer, I have an idea of what it means when people say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that to me would be new wave beer uh, in many ways. That's the definition that I understand when I hear it most often, like what someone might be referring to. In that definition, um, you have do's and don'ts or? In that, for me, just understanding what someone's saying, no. Uh, I'm just trying to catch some meaning from others uh, as a word. Um, so the most common use of it I hear is um, new wave beers, experimental beers, uh, high contact production, we'll say, like uh, the people producing it have, it's less automated perhaps, or they have high level contact with either development of that or the idea. Um, but if you're talking about what a craft is and what like an artisanal or craft beer is to me, um, it's a beer that's an expression of something other than just efficiency or ease or financial gain or efficiency, volume. Efficiency, very good word. It's a, there are many meanings of efficiency as well and many aspects of that. But uh, I would say we do some things very efficiently at Taranka. Uh, but the way the decisions are made in production um, is expressing something about the identity or uh, the what that company wants to do other than just sell something um that that's what for me a craft is uh, you've got a person that's doing something special specific in a high we'll say high contact situation or a specialty situation that makes a certain batch unique or something um, or every batch maybe is a bit different. Um, and when it's a craft, that's the indication I have. I, I don't have a number of hectoliters in mind. Mm -hmm. I don't have particular ingredients or styles in mind when I hear about it. I, I just hope that it's something other than marketing or gaining money or being very, like, an easy way uh, of doing things. I hope it's something different than that in craft beer. Very, very nice words, uh, Casey Wellman. <laughs> Thanks uh, a lot, thank man. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dieter. Oh, sorry that I cannot see you right now on the webcam. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's still the same thing? Still yeah, the same it's still thing the same thing. It's, uh, you're like yeah. an orange, gray, rainbow bow thing. Yeah, I see the same thing. I have no idea where it came right. from. I will, I will very quickly just try to get it up and going. I'm going to try using my camera in another app. Maybe that triggers something. No. No. Nope. All right. It doesn't want me. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Casey, when you're, um, yeah, when the lockdown is over, we have to grab a beer. Eh? So, uh, yeah, yeah, we have to you come to Brussels or I come uh, crash the rank I, uh, again. I love to come to Brussels. Uh, we All can right. meet at Heast, uh, my favorite bar in Brussels. Uh, Do you know Heast? What? Heast? jean la Jody? Uh, Heast. Heast. Hist, hist. Yeah, hist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know them. I know them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Uh, no problem. Uh, 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 that's noted yeah. down. <laughs> that's carved into yeah. stone. <laughs> All right, man. See you. All right, Dieter. It's on. See you. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs>